In the summer between my senior year of high school and the start of college, I got a job working the evening shift to my town's local crab shack from 2.30 until 9. You know the place, even if you've never been there. If you've ever gone on vacation to Maine or Cape Cod or really anywhere in coastal New England, you've seen at least a dozen places like it. Ramshackle eateries along the boardwalk, decorated with oars and lobster traps, hand-painted signs advertising standard fare, lobster rolls, clam strips, hamburgers, onion rings, fries. I'd eaten there once or twice growing up, but it was more for the tourists than the locals. For the most part, it was a pretty normal place, but there were two weird things about it. First was that the cook, at Romando, was completely blind. I know that sounds crazy, and I didn't believe it at first either, but the longer I worked there, the more I began to see how it was possible. The kitchen wasn't a big place, and Ramondo, a withered and leathery man with a permanent grimace and a permanent slump to his posture, knew by routine its every in and out. From what I could see through the little window behind the register, he kept his kitchen utensils clearly organized using a system of hooks hanging from a cork board, and with a menu as limited as ours, he could very easily just fall into a comfortable routine, no sight required. There was a rumor he was mute, too, but I heard him speak once. But the second thing about the crab shack was that it was open 24 hours a day. It may not sound that weird, but for one thing, even during the busy season, uh, late June through early September, Nothing out here stays open all night long, and I mean nothing. We're a tourist town, yeah, but we're not one of the big ones. Just a bump on the map halfway between Gloucester and Innsmouth. Nothing here is open past midnight, uh, let alone all night long. I only knew one of the night shift guys, uh, Chuck Landingham, a smallish, preppy-looking kid I'd gone to high school with. Uh, not a friend, exactly, just someone you recognized when you see him in the hallway. Back in May, when I first started, he used to come in a little early, and we'd chat a bit while I rang out my register and washed up for the night. As the summer passed, though, uh, working the night shift took a toll on Chuck. I wasn't surprised. Uh, switching to a completely nocturnal schedule must be pretty rough for anyone. Dark circles appeared and then grew long beneath his eyes, which themselves took on a faraway look that I can't quite describe, except to say that even when he met my gaze, he didn't seem to see me, seemed instead to look through me at some invisible mystery on the other side of my head. He became distant, quiet, withdrawn, and by the end of July we'd stopped chatting altogether. Uh, one night, as I was leaving, he stopped by, uh, grabbing me by the wrist and holding me back. Uh, he looked at me expectantly and opened his mouth as if to speak, but let go without saying anything and turned away. I was halfway to the door when I heard him mutter to himself, I can't do it anymore. He whispered in a dull, defeated tone, and then a little louder, I can't, I can't do it anymore. He quit not long after that, but that was the last time I saw him. I don't know where he is now. After he left, I got a frantic call from my boss, uh, the owner of the restaurant, asking if I could pick up Chuck's last few night shifts. After seeing the toll it had taken on him, I wasn't inclined to agree, especially because the summer was winding down and college would start in just a couple weeks for me. I was already considering giving my notice early and taking a little time to relax. Uh, the last thing I wanted was to completely retool my sleep schedule right before I started my academic career. I can't say what it was exactly that changed my mind. No, uh, that's a lie. He offered me time and a half of the night shift's rates, uh, plus he'd still pay me for my regular shifts, even though I wouldn't be working them. He begged with me, pleaded with me to pick up the shifts, and I remember being a bit put off by his dramatics. There was actually fear in his voice, like he was scared the crab shack might have to simply close for a night or two. Or three, actually. Uh, there were three of them. Three overnight shifts I agreed to cover. Just three shifts and I'd be making more money in just that time than I had the whole previous month. I don't have a lot to say about my first night shift at the Crab Shack. The most noteworthy thing I could mention is this. Uh, nobody came. Nobody at all. I rolled in that night at 9pm at the same time I'd normally be leaving and I took over for Jackie. 
another one of the cashiers whom I didn't know very well. After she left, I was a little surprised to glance through the little window that led into the kitchen and see that Romando was still there, apparently working the night shift too. Didn't this guy ever go home? The more I think about it, the more I began to realize how unlikely it was that for the past three months it had always been Romando at the grill. Uh, didn't the crab shack have any other cooks? Uh, hey man, I called into the kitchen sometime after 2 a.m. Uh, is it always this dead on the overnight? No answer. I drove home the next morning as exhausted as I'd ever been, never mind that no customers had ever materialized. Sometimes work is less exhausting than boredom. Uh, at least if I'd kept busy, there'd have been something to occupy my mind. When I got home, I crawled into bed and slept all morning, uh, into the afternoon, uh, straight through the day and into the evening. I have even less to say about my second night shift. Uh, this time I didn't bother to try and engage the cook in conversation, but other than that, the night was exactly the same. I was exhausted from the beginning, so the hours felt even longer this time felt even more boring and somehow even emptier. The next morning, as I climbed into bed, I remember thinking that now I, that now I understand why the shift burned Chuck out the way it had. But I was wrong. On the third night, we had a customer. Here he comes. The blind cook spoke in a deep voice, much deeper than his slight and elderly frame would suggest. He spoke up out of nowhere, and it took me by surprise, as much because I'd never heard him speak before, as because I had no idea what he meant. When I glanced up from my phone, I saw that the dining room was still empty. The windows against the far wall still displayed nothing but the thick blanket of night, mared only by what little stretch of pavement the anemic streetlights could reach. Who? I started to ask. But before I got any further, the front door opened and in walked my first and only customer during my three nights on the night shift at the Crab Shack. He was a tall man, tall and broad, filling the doorway before moving forward with a liquid grace, surprising for someone of his size, letting the door slam behind him. He wore a suit with a matching short-brimmed Panama hat, both crisp and clean and of a color I'd never seen before. What I cannot describe is his face. It's not that I've forgotten, uh, no. Every detail of that night is unfortunately burned into my memory for as long as I live. The reason I cannot describe his face is that I found I could not look at it. When I tried, every time I tried, my eyes would simply glide right past it or around it, and I would find myself staring at something just past his shoulder or over his head or down at the knots in his tie or up at the cloth band around his hat. Uh, welcome to the Crab Shack, I greeted him in a dry whisper, the only voice I found I could muster. Uh, can I take your order? He nodded slightly. Even without seeing his face, that nod conveyed the presence of a smile. And then he ordered. I cannot recount his order here. I would not know how to begin, nor would I dare repeat it if I could. He ordered in a language I had never heard before barely even registered as a language, guttural and elegant and moist. His order contained noises I had never heard before in a human voice, terrible words with uncharted vowels, a language which it is my dearest hope I will never have the misfortune of hearing ever again. Worse yet, I found myself nodding, as I would to any other customer, as if he had ordered a simple lobster roll or hamburger or a plate of clam strips. With my eyes still on the knot of his tie, I punched a few buttons on the register. I never saw what they were, and my hands moved as if on their own accord. I don't know what his total came to, and I don't know what he gave me, but it was not money. I placed it on the register, though later when I looked again, it wasn't there. I turned and made my way over to the little window in the kitchen. Hey, uh, Romando, I called out. The guy wants a... And then, impossibly, horribly, I found myself repeating the order back to the chef. Word for word, noise for noise, it all came back. But as terrible as the sound of those words was, the feel of them coming out of me was even worse. Like an angry school of slippery eels thrashing and fighting as they clawed up my throat. 
birthed into the night by my unwilling vocal cords. You got it, Romando answered balefully, and then he began to cook. As I've said, I could not see far into the kitchen, and definitely not far enough to see just what it was that Romando placed in the deep fryer that night. I could see him holding something with both hands, something heavy by the way he struggled, and yet no bigger than a small meatloaf. The sound it made when it hit the hot oil surpassed the familiar sizzle of any seafood I'd heard fried before, uh, not just louder, but higher in pitch and almost emotive, almost like a scream. The smell it made I will not try to describe except to say that even now there are still nights when I awake in a sweat from dreams that consist of nothing more than that smell. Order up. I broke myself out of my reverie as I saw that Ramondo had slid towards me a plate, a horrible plate holding a fried nightmare from which I should have looked away, right away, uh, immediately away, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I wish I had. Instead, I will have to live the rest of my life remembering that dish, remembering that order, and that sick and twisted and horrible order. The circular burst of tentacles, all deep fried and no two the same length, none originating from a common point, each sticking off in its own direction. One of them not a tentacle at all, but a finger curled up as if making a come-hither gesture. A long and gnarly fingernail peeking out through the bread. A jagged row of flat white teeth, just half a jaw, a quarter smile, no more than a slight curvature ending in a single incisor. And the claws, too. Of course, the claws. The claws with no arm attached, but which emerged from that dead lump of flesh like mushrooms growing in a cluster on a cadaver's cheek. Finally, and most horribly, Near the center of the mass bulge, what I thought at first resembled a blister, but which I quickly realized was not, but an eye. A single, hazel eye. Dead, but staring with a preserved sadness. But did I see it blink? Did I see it turn, ever so slightly, to meet mine directly, and to stare in a silence and unheeded plea for clemency? Did it look at me? Did it blink? Impossible, I tell myself. I couldn't have. I imagined it. The man, or whatever it was, but a man it was not, took the tray from me. I think he might have nodded his thanks, but I couldn't be sure. He carried his meat over to one of the booths and sat with his back to me. All I could see were his shoulders. Uh, when he ate, he barely moved. His arms never left his side. After he left, I worked up the nerve and then turned once more to the little window in the kitchen. Uh, what? I started to ask, before erupting into a sudden coughing fit, my throat suddenly thick with mucus. What the fuck was that? I can barely see Romando, just the right side of his face, just enough to notice when he smiled. The first time I had seen any expression beyond indifference across that leathery countenance. There was no mirth within it, though. It almost seemed cruel, even sadistic. All he said was, Don't you have to go bust his tray? I quit the next day. I, I haven't been back since. A week later, I left for college, and as soon as I could, I transferred somewhere else, somewhere further inland. I never visited home. I still haven't. Not in all the years since. And I don't think I ever will. I'm more comfortable out here. Uh, where the only seafood restaurants the occasional red lobster, far from the ocean where live such creatures as the one I once served. But it's not that creature itself that haunts me the most when I recall that summer before my freshman year of college, though haunts me it does. I often dream of what it might have been before it met Romando's deep fryer. Nor is it the identity of the man whose face would accept not even the slightest glance, nor the nature of his relationship with my boss, uh, the owner of the crab shack, that had left the latter in such obvious mortal terror at the thought of the restaurant closing for even a single night shift. No, the question that dominates my mind and forces me into fixation until I tear my thoughts away back to matter more benign is, and always will be, did I see it blink?
my mom was on a business trip, and my father was at the nearby convenience store, buying cigarettes, or uh, yuckies as he called them. It was his tactic to ensure I wouldn't smoke, and it worked. It was 9am, and usually my father would arrive home in about 10 minutes. Uh, however, we lived in more of a wooded area, and the closest convenience store was about 2 kilometers away. Uh, I hated that my parents decided to live in this godforsaken place. Uh, literally everywhere we went was a trip. If I had my way, we would have lived in a centrally located area. Uh, where people lived nearby, and the police wouldn't take 15 minutes to arrive to a house break-in. About 14 minutes passed, and I went to the kitchen to grab leftover tortellini. As I opened the microwave door, I heard what sounded like a chalkboard being scraped with a switchblade, and I dropped my plates in fear. It shattered on the floor, and I groaned a long, Fuck. That was not the most important thing right now. I still needed to figure out what in God's name made that noise. The only pet in the house was my pet cockatiel, Heather, and she was a very silent bird, except for when she was hungry. I opened the utensil drawer and pulled out a cutting knife. I left my phone in my room, and my heart rate was rising quickly, and I had no idea what to do. The most logical reason in my mind was to make a break for it. I booked it to my room, tripping over dining room chairs, but as I was reaching for my bedroom door, I saw him. His, or its, most notable feature was his permanent grin. It was nothing like I saw before, but seemed human. It was an emotionless grin. It was an emotionless grin, like one you make to try and seem tough in front of your middle school crush when you fall out of your seat. His teeth were incredibly bright, as if they could light up a mine shaft. His body looked elongated and stretched to its breaking point, like a piece of gum that's at its last strand, like one tiny nudge could make his body fall apart. It was like a stress toy the teachers give to special children in class, the ones that have bite marks in them. He had no hair whatsoever, not a single strand, just this alien but strangely familiar creature. It looked like he was made out of melted aluminum, and strangely, he had no eyes. But the most terrifying thing is that I could feel him watching me. I tried to run, but my eyes were locked onto him, and his smile slowly grew as he slowly lifted his skimpy leg and started to come closer. I tried to scream, but my mouth felt stapled shut. It was like he was trying to play with me, like how some animals play with their prey as they wait for their impending doom. I felt myself start to cry. I thought of how incomplete my life was. I didn't want to die. Not now. The creature could see my tears, and the lights went out. Everything was pitch black. I couldn't see a thing. I screamed as loud as I could, and my dad burst through the door. My dad screamed, Mark, in terror. The lights went on again, and I saw my dad in the front door. I lunged at him in tears, afraid and confused. D did you see it? I sobbed into his arm. W what? See what? The monster. Did you see him? I muttered. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. What monster? Why were you screaming? He replied, brushing my hair out of my face. His hands felt like charcoal. I explained everything to him as best I could. Thankfully, he didn't believe I was insane at first and dialed 911. They gave a detailed search and found no trace of any intruders in my house. How could they find nothing? He seemed so real. It couldn't possibly be a hallucination. I decided to sleep in my father's room that night. For the first few nights, after everything seemed normal... I got a new job as a mall security guard, and my mom was coming home soon. I saw him again on my fourth day on the job. It was the last hour before the mall closed, and we closed fairly late for a mall, at 8.57 to be exact. There were only about ten stragglers in the mall. I was stationed at the food courts, and my co-worker Ernesto was nearby at the clothing stores. I never got to know the others, but they were scattered around. There was only about 20 minutes left until closing time, and I heard my walkie-talkie go off. Need assistance at American Eagle ASAP. Over. Ernesto's raspy voice said. I'll be there. Over. I responded. Strangely, no one else picked up on the walkie-talkie. I was running down the escalator as every single light went out in an instant. My heart sank. Is that godforsaken creature back again? I couldn't see anything. So I felt around for my flashlight and turned it on. 
Uh, hello? I yelled. Not a single sound whatsoever, except my heavy breaths. I turned on my walkie-talkie. Uh, is anyone there? I said, scared shitless. It took around four seconds for a response, but I heard my walkie-talkie go off, and all that could be heard was a raspy breath. Uh, what scared me even more is that the breath was nearby. I nearly pissed myself as I ran to the escalator and hid in the back of a Johnny Rockets. Uh, no one was there. I came to the conclusion that I was in this mall with the creature. I closed the door and pushed the metal racks against the door, making a shabby barricade. I tried to dial 911, but all that was on the other line was the raspy breathing from the walkie-talkie. I dialed every number I could think of, but it was the same exact raspy breathing. I decided to try and shock him with my taser. Uh, he was heavily banging on the door, and it wouldn't hold much longer. I quickly turned the door handle and shocked it. It made a scream that made me collapse to the floor in agony, and my ears had started bleeding. For some reason, it still smiled. I quickly got up, blood pouring from my ears, and ran down the escalator. I ran to the emergency exits, and I could hear its footsteps behind me. I could feel my throat start to tighten, and I wanted to collapse. I kicked open the door and ran into the road. I looked behind me and saw the creature grinning at me. He waved his arm and waved like a goodbye wave. He walked back into the mall and faded into the darkness. I instantly dialed 911 with thoughts rushing through my mind. Was he waving, saying that I was free? No, it couldn't be that simple. In all the terror, I somehow forgot about the blood from my ears. To my surprise, it wasn't there anymore. I had no idea what to think. I, I just froze. I sat there in the middle of the road for five minutes. No cars passed for that whole entire time. Uh, my little pause in time broke when I heard the police sirens. I quickly ran to them and explained what happened. The police searched through the mall. The lights were off, like I said. But when they went inside of the American Eagle, they found Ernesto and some other guards, dead corpses. Their eyes had been removed, and their blood spelled out Mark. I never slept the same after that. I still have night terrors from the experience, but... I never saw the creature after that. I don't know if I've escaped from him yet, but he has given me a few years of peace. <laughs>